Welcome back to Cookie Pocket, an attempt at a podcast. Uh, this is the second of three holiday specials we're going to be doing this December. Uh, if you're interested in checking out our first, in which we talk about perennial Christmas classic Die Hard, uh, you can find it at City Mist Productions on YouTube or at Cookie Pocket, an attempt at a podcast, anywhere podcasts are found. Uh, today, I'm joined by Mitchell and Christian to talk about Black Christmas from 1974 a film directed by Bob Clark in which a faceless, gibbering killer finds his way into a college sorority house near Christmas and starts to stalk and uh, kill the house's teenage inhabitants. Uh, so, as almost always, why don't we start out with overall thoughts. Uh, Mitchell and Christian, what did you think of the movie? Well, I guess I'll go first and sort <laughs> go of right ahead. break the ice on my long-running... Uh, I'll, I'm going to enlighten the audience and my reputation in our group here. Yes. Um, I think everybody my, knows. My, yes. Well, well my, my unofficial nickname is one out of five because <laughs> I apparently hate everything Zach presents me, or at least that's that's how it's perceived. Almost and always. I, I despise that perception, and I'm trying to uh, to uh, uh, work away at, at it and, and uh, break it down a bit. And uh, this was a great first step because I quite... I, w- I guess you could say enjoyed, even though I was deeply disturbed. I appreciated this film quite a bit, and I gave it a four out of five. Yes, which is very high. Ooh. So especially for uh, Zach, not a one. That's actually, <laughs> uh, listeners. I just want to fill this in. That's the first four out of five he's ever given to a movie I've recommended on the show out of <laughs> out of twenty three previous episodes. So this is a big step. <laughs> yes, yes, and hopefully this is the first of many. Um, I was I was really impressed in general. Um, I think the, the nature of the 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 way everything sort of unravels. Uh, one one of my common complaints about some of your other picks, Zach, is that um, me me being the the layperson, probably the least cinephilic of the group. I guess you <laughs> the could say the most zoomer. I, <laughs> yes, the most zoomer. There there we go. I I tend to uh, complain about the the amount of attention that. It's something sometimes requires of an audience. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll be like, this bored me, and it's <laughs> stupid, and I want to watch something explode. I want to watch something. Mandalorian. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the case this time. I found to be, I found myself thoroughly entertained, at least, um, if not entertained, then in suspense. Mm-hmm. And I felt a, a lot of notable things kept occurring, and it didn't feel like, um, I don't know if you would call this, uh, I don't know what, what what the term is, a slow burner or whatever, but it, it, it didn't feel like one of those because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, the murders are sort of staggered in a way that um, allow the suspense to continue building without leaving the audience sort of in flux for a long period of time. And um, just generally, I think this film is really well handled. My only gripes with it are some, like, technical plot things mm-hmm. and uh, uh, actions that characters should very logically have made but didn't make for the sake of uh, the creepiness factor and not discovering the the murder and what have you but um, to me that that is a relatively minor gripe when everything else is executed so well and that um, little oversight enables the film to exceed in other categories so I gave it a four out of five um, I think uh, this is one of those films that I enjoyed more in retrospect because I don't have to be terrified when I'm thinking about it after the fact. Yeah. But um, it's probably the creepiest, for me at least, the creepiest horror film you've shown me yet. The one that um, scared me the most, I guess you could say. And uh, I, I, to some extent, enjoyed it. So four out of five. All right, great. Uh, and we'll come back to those gripes later, but we'll 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 put a pin in them for now. No, um, Zach will put a pin in them and, <laughs> yes. and go completely 100% full power on. I'm I'm over here with all my pins in the board. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm putting a pin there. Uh, Mitchell, what did you think? I really liked it, and um, I think you know, it, obviously everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna break the ice, my own ice, this time <laughs> and say that obviously this is you know this heavily inspired Halloween and yes. partially inspired Evil Dead. Mm-hmm. Um, in a lot of ways, um, especially some very key sequences that are like almost shot for shot, exactly the same. Um, but I mean, I for, for with really good reason, obviously. I think there's a lot of really good suspense. I feel like um, the just in general, the pacing was extremely well done. I, I feel like there's even when it didn't feel like anything was going on, it always felt like there's something going on. Mm-hmm. Um, part of that is especially to the due to the sound design. Um, 
you know the mm-hmm. phone ringing obviously yes. is one of the key features in the entire film yeah um and it, it is very important to the plot it's not just some gimmick and just watching this i mean even within like the first 10 minutes i was thinking i already know this is going to be one of those types of films that's completely just trounces people's expectations and mm-hmm. it's like I could easily tell that a lot of... I, I read your original review, Zach, and I kind of disagree with your opinion on them not being believable college girls. I mean, I guess physically... I agree with you, Mitchell. I think they're very believable. I, I think physically, maybe they look a little old, but yeah. like, I've met some extremely old college women and men before, so um, actually, and just look that way. Um, but uh, I think I think they're really believable, and they fit, they fit their own aesthetic. I feel like they were not, you know adherent to any certain cliche that's already been established i mean you know th- obviously thinking about it over time you think about it like they're trying to trounce the cliches with these new you know these newer horror movies in the past like 20 years or even 30 years um but i just thought it was really interesting to see them you know react to situations so realistically and just have things naturally play out i mean obviously i feel like you know the the killer himself is you know not like super duper intimidating i mean Really, most yeah. of his intimidation comes from like his mannerisms and very good impressions. <laughs> his phone calls are the, the, kind of what really creeps you out. His yeah, voice, but I yeah. think I think I, I would almost say his his character is more interesting than the original Michael Myers. I would say. Yeah. Um, and I think I think over time they developed Michael Myers um, in the Halloween you know series a little bit. But I, I, overall, I felt like Billy was a lot more interesting a killer and just generally a lot like christian had said a lot of what christian had said i I agree with um the kills are really spaced out and that's really important i think for a slasher i think if you just if you have a lot of them in a row then you have to keep that going you kind of have to keep the trend you know otherwise the the viewer the audience is going to notice like an abrupt change Mm -hmm. but i feel like even the sequences that were there was no kills at all was just really there's a very you know thick plot development and like yeah. even the characters were really intriguing and the, the very subtle cinematography and like the piano in the background even though yes. that was really repetitive i feel like that was really effective so overall i mean besides some really weird you know just weird things mm-hmm. <laughs> that were not that didn't really fit like the atmosphere that was trying to be like slow and and you know like a slow burner and really interesting on its own i feel like there's just some really weird decisions and like christian had said the plot holes i mean some of them are extremely large but like mm-hmm. i mean everything like exactly what christian said everything that, that was outside of that was executed so well um with such like i guess a limited budget it almost feels like um i four out of five is definitely a score i would give it yeah uh limited budget is definitely right this was only made on six hundred and twenty thousand canadian dollars uh, which is really, really low. Um, you'd, you'd see that more in the, in the 70s than you would now, but it, it's still pretty low. Um, and uh, Canadian. especially this is kind of uh, coming out in a pretty early area or uh, time for the, the Canadian film industry. Uh, so this is kind of one of those upstart early Canadian horror films. Uh, in terms of my, my overall thoughts... Um, <laughs> This is a movie that I like. I wouldn't necessarily say that I love it. It's not one of my favorites. I don't own it. Um, but every time I watch it, I find uh, little new things to appreciate um, and little new things that creep me out. Uh, we mentioned my first Twitter review that I did of this last year um, where I mentioned I gave it a 3 out of 5. And I thought, oh, you know, it's, it's all right. There's some really unsettling stuff, but there's distracting stuff in it as well. Uh, and it, it got me a lot more this time. This time I gave it a 4 out of 5. I think that it's better than I initially thought it was. I think it's very, very suspenseful. Uh, I do think those characters are believable. In that original review, I was kind of talking more about, like, the appearance of the characters. Mm-hmm. Like, there's one girl who has a boyfriend who looks like he's, like, 46. <laughs> like, he's, he's balding and he's got a huge mustache. It's like, that that man's not in college. Um, but aside from the appearance of the characters, I do feel like the way they behave is very natural. Uh, yes, yes, you've got a photo of him right there. His name is, yes. like, Lance or Chris or something like that. I was like, and that guy's gonna die, and he, he never shows up, like, almost ever again. This day, he so looks like, like, your great uncle or something. Like, he does not look like a college student at all. But otherwise, other than appearance, I, I do like the characters. Uh, Mitchell, you mentioned that this is one of the very first slasher films, or at least one of the first in uh, North America. There are kind of previous yeah. examples from Italy, uh, but for our listeners who aren't aware, uh, if they're out there, uh, a, a slasher film is essentially a subgenre <laughs> of horror in which you've got a masked or faceless killer 
who goes through a, a set of characters and kind of kills them one by one. So in a film like this, the characters are a really important aspect. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about those characters and their relationships with each other. Uh, did we find them likable and relatable? Did we understand their relationships and the things that have the way that they were involved with each other? Uh, what did we think? Yeah, I thought they were uh, relatable and what have you. And I, I definitely echo Mitchell's point before. I think that they were believable as college students for sure. Mm -hmm. Even, um, our, our uh, great uncle with the mustache. I think um, I'm pretty sure I've seen at least one college senior that's uh, partially balding and plenty of plenty of college men with facial hair. Mm -hmm. So even that doesn't bother me too much personally. Um, I, I thought I thought the performances were were generally really well received and um, in terms of believability uh, of the relationships, I found that to be uh, convincing as well. I think the only uh, point in which I reach uh, difficulty with uh, the believability of those relationships is when uh, the the search for, particularly for the first person that goes missing, mm -hmm. no, they never actually, and this is my biggest like plot um, uh, issue, is they never search the house, which just makes absolutely no sense at all, not to search the house, even if only to, to search for clues about where she could have gone. It, mm -hmm. It, it it doesn't make any sense for the for the law enforcement or even for her friends um, on their own accord just to search the house and so that's what bothered me and to me um, that um, makes the relationships more questionable than any of the uh, interactions we see on screen or um, the way uh, characters talk about one another off off screen when the other is off screen um, I I wouldn't say any of the actors stuck out to me. Uh, a ton besides um i mean we've already established the voice work on the 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 faceless billy character yes. is, is um fittingly terrifying and um yeah we've we've got this uh ongoing trope whenever we've got uh public servants that appear in i feel like almost any of our films be it something like this or die hard or or anything half of them are like great mm -hmm. perfect people and the other half are like total jerks and yeah. there's no in between so um I, I mean those people yes fe <laughs> the new area code yeah. <laughs> they uh they uh they serve their purpose i mm -hmm. guess you could say and and those those performances were were fine as well so uh, generally yeah um good performances and i think it's probably for the best that none of the sorority girls stood out more than each other to to uh support that group dynamic more so yeah yeah well, um i the... would say jack before yes. say anything <laughs> go right the first ahead, thing i'll say is i'm jess i'm an american college student okay <laughs> university of toronto in <laughs> in a sorority of, trust me i'm yes. from america olivia right? hussey does have a very noticeable accent in this film jess stands out more than I thought she yeah. would. I thought yeah. she was going to be, like, the shy one that just, like, you know, is so worried about everything and then, like, backs into a corner and then just dies mm -hmm. or something. <laughs> um, so she exceeded expectations. And then her, um, you know, that the abortion thing and all that stuff, that her having yes. a kid was extremely uh, important to the yeah. plot as well. And, you know, just uh, kind of w weaving in Peter in there. And I feel like, obviously, looking at looking back on it, I feel like Peter would be, like, a, I mean, looking back on it, like, to the 70s, I'd be like, oh, yeah, everybody knows it's not Peter. Like, that's that's kind of, like, a given, like, from the beginning. It obviously yeah. cannot be Peter. Mm -hmm. But I think them presenting that, you know, I don't want to say cliche because it wasn't really a cliche yet, but mm -hmm. they were kind of just pushing him as, like, the red herring yeah. of him being the killer. And I think there was definitely, like, total credible evidence. I don't think there was any dispute as to whether or not it should have been him or not i feel like that there, there was a very clear progression towards him being the killer so i really appreciated that yeah. being fleshed out um and his acting was pretty good too i feel like the piano scene was kind of kind of weird i guess i understand yeah. why everybody yeah. understands why it's there but mm -hmm. like i feel like it was a little bit drawn out but peter was mm -hmm. was really convincing and you know he was kind of being a little creepy at the end and just creepy enough you know so i think all of that definitely fit in really well i think jess's uh screams are better than jamie lee curtis's screams okay yeah um <laughs> hot take um i feel like yeah barb and phil i can remember everybody's name yes now. barb and phil are both really convincing college students with the exception of barb looking a little little aged otherwise yeah. i think barb being kind of drunk and just smoking and being sexual is, is very 
Very accurate. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to leave it like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, a very believing be- believing sorority. Uh, I guess Claire Claire is the one that dies in meeting, right? It's Claire. Yes, yeah. Okay. Claire mm-hmm. is pretty good. She didn't really have much going on. I mean, she looked pretty good in the rocker, so good on her. Um, very sad. Pay <laughs> oh, respects. But, uh, but yeah, and the killer, obviously. is. I think the killer was probably the best actor we never actually really saw. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, physically very much um so yeah i think he was definitely the best performance by far um and then the housekeeper mrs mack also she did she did pretty good and her her you know her out outward Mm. personality and just being a a a cliche uh housekeeper for a a sorority house was pretty funny so yeah very 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 good acting especially with the low budget yeah A, a lot of the time uh slasher films that followed in this one's wake get a lot of flack for having your sort of generic characters uh you know you've got your nerd you've got your outsider you've got your shy girl and i don't really think that this movie follows those archetypes or stereotypes to a great degree um Mm -hmm. i mean barb is kind of you know she's drunk and she's smoking but she's she still you know makes jokes she still gets along with the others she still has some sort of insecurity that gives her more Mm -hmm. depth um jess has the whole thing with uh with peter where they're where she's debating getting an abortion uh, and breaking up with him, which definitely adds depth to her character, and you care about her. Uh, even Claire, um, you don't really get to know her, but you do need to get to know her father, um, and you get to see him becoming more and more worried throughout the film as he looks for her, and it helps to make them feel like like real people more than, say, the victims in any Friday the 13th or later Halloween film, which are sort of just fodder for the killer when, when they eventually show up. Uh, in terms of kind of plot holes uh, that, that you mentioned, Christian, uh, like, oh, why don't they, why don't they search the house? Um, I, I do think, I do think that can be a little frustrating, especially towards the end. Uh, the end of the movie, after it's meant to be, oh, the tension's gone, the, the killer has been killed, and we know who it is, um, and we're meant to have that tension of it's all over, and then it's revealed that the police searched the house and found the bodies of Barb and Phil, but they didn't go up in the attic, um, and they didn't find Mrs. Mack, and they didn't find Claire. Uh, I think that can that can be a little frustrating, um, especially on the first watch. For me, I thought, why why did they leave the bodies up there? Why why did they not search the entire house? But in that scene, I I think you do recognize that there's a lot going on. Uh, the doctor's meant to stay there, and then he can't stay there because the one guy passes out. Uh, Nash is meant to stay there, and then he can't stay there because he's called away to get a car. Like, I think there's so much hullabaloo going on that it can be kind of a, oh, well, so much was going on at once that nobody ever made it up to the attic and nobody really realized, even though they might have wanted to. Uh, but I do agree that it, that it kind of is uh, a whole. Um, but I, I don't think it necessarily stands against the characters or their actions, necessarily. I think most things in this movie, most actions the characters take and the relationships that, with they, that they have with each other are believable. Um, even the stereotypical, why don't you just run out the front door instead of down to the basement, which you would typically shout while throwing pretzels at the screen while wa- when watching this in a group, makes sense. Because earlier in the film, they see that the door is having troubles and they've got to get somebody over to fix it, mm-hmm. so it jams. Like, that's that's a great little yeah. foreshadowing thing that a lot of mm-hmm. movies wouldn't necessarily do. Mm-hmm. Um, now, something else we should talk about, uh, which we've already kind of talked about to a certain extent, uh, are the scares. Uh, this is a horror film, so it's out to, to horrify you. Did you guys find this film uh, frightening? And if so, are there any specific moments or aspects of it that you found particularly frightening? Yeah, short answer is yes. Um, longer answer is um, the first experience with Billy mm-hmm. when he's... Um, uh, indulging in really, really gross obscenities over the phone, yeah. and then um, the girls are all like, uh, "Go away! Shut up! You're a meanie!" <laughs> and then he's like, in, in like the most serious deadpan voice, he just says that he's going to kill them. Yeah. That that was pretty. Uh, yeah, that was pretty spooky. That 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 that, that was scary. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say there were any like jump scares or moments where I was like, "Oh, oh my god!" Mm-hmm. Um, everything else was. Um, uh, there was some some sort of build up towards i think mm-hmm. and um yeah but just generally billy was was always at least somewhat frightening um mm-hmm. and um in terms of uh whether i knew i i i was like briefly believed that it was um 
I forget his name. Uh, Jen's Jen's boyfriend. Uh, Peter, the only yeah. second in which I sort of yeah, Peter. The only second in which I sort of fell for that was when I think we saw a shadow or a silhouette, and the hair was like almost exactly I like Peter's yeah. or, or yeah. something like I, that. I did see that um, too. That was cool. Yeah, it, it was just a good touch. But um, yeah, in, in terms of in terms of frightening stuff, um, and it by the way, it didn't bother me that Jen went to the basement because um, in those moments. It, and I've actually been one of those people that throw that's throwing stuff at the screen is like, why are they doing the illogical thing? And every time you guys say it's because they're under a tremendous amount of stress and fear for their life. And I'm yeah. beginning yeah. to understand that now. So, yeah. yes, I, I didn't I didn't take as much <laughs> issue with that as I did with um, the uh, uh, failed procedure by the I guess you could say the police at the end. But um, uh, hmm. back to Billy and being frightened. Yeah, just every phone call, really, I would say I don't think. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about the, the piano being repetitive and the, the sound of the phone ringing being repetitive, but I don't think it ever loses its edge because it, despite that, I don't think it's overused. And I think every phone call is really deliberate, especially after um, you, you see the phone getting tapped by, by law enforcement. So uh, overall, I just think Billy was really well executed. And yes, I was frightened. Yeah, I think the phone calls are... There's several phone calls throughout the film for people who might not have seen it. Uh, the basic idea is that throughout the film, uh, the killer is calling the girls in the house. He's he's prank calling them and doing these strange voices over the phone. Uh, but every single time, there's like a different voice or he's saying something different. And it, it, he's saying things about, oh, the baby and what, my, what your mother and I must know is. And like there's little hints of like... <laughs> What did he do? Like, where is this coming from? Who's Agnes? Get rid of the baby. What did he do with Agnes? <laughs> what, what did he do with the baby? And it because you never really learn these things of like who Billy is or what he did, but just those little snippets of things he was probably told makes you well, what on earth did he do with Agnes? Like, what did he do with the baby? And they they drop those little clues throughout that really gets you to think about it and gets you to think of the scary thing that might be happening at the end of that phone call. Uh, uh, Mitchell, what were your thoughts? Uh, I, I feel like it was more suspenseful rather than frightening, like immediately mm-hmm. frightening. Um, it kind of reminds me of the changeling in that sense, but I think wow. this executes it like three times better. I know I just brought a, I had to yes. drop there, <laughs> George C. <laughs> Scott. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I thought it was the phone calls. I, t- I totally agree. The phone calls were by far like the most frightening thing. I mean, it's totally realistic. I feel like I've, I think I've gotten a call very similar to one of those calls yeah. and I was just like. All right, I'm just gonna hang up on you. But um, yeah. But yeah, no. In the movie, I think it totally works. It definitely fits, you know, the story well. Like it's just so well integrated in every respect with the plot and with the character development and everything. So I, I think, I think the phone calls are definitely the best parts. Um, I think, I think the actual kills themselves were pretty good. I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, when Barb dies, you already know. I'm like thinking, I just saw this recently in yeah. Halloween, and I know I, I, I it loses the impact just because I, I know how it's gonna pan out. But mm-hmm. I feel like trying to put myself in like you know the directing perspective, I think that was really you know I think that was really well done and just the set the build up and the caroling especially at the same time. Yes, I think that was by far the best kill. That's a great um, editing choice. Yeah. Yeah, and then just him talk, murmuring and stuff, and she's just, like, making kind of, like, semi-muffled, like, screams, like, because you're so in shock, you can't, you know, you can't really breathe well, mm-hmm. and she's having that, you know, the breathing problem earlier, I guess, with asthma, but I just thought, I, I really thought that was really well done, and, and I think the, honestly, I think the Claire's death at the beginning was probably the least effective, just because I was kind of just waiting for the jump scare really? to happen, and then it happened, but, um... Yeah, and then I think her I think her being dead was more frightening cumulatively to me than her actually dying. Hmm. And um I know frightening I guess wouldn't be the real word, but I just I think suspense, I think suspenseful is probably the best adjective. I wouldn't say necessarily that it's like scary or anything. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything that was immediately scary besides the actual phone calls. So, yeah. Christian, you seem to disagree with Mitchell's assessment of Claire's death. What what did you think of that scene? I understand where he's coming from. Um, for me, I probably, I guess I found that the most frightening because, well, I don't have the the experience with Halloween or Friday yeah. the 13th or what have you. Every horror movie I've seen, except for, I guess, It, sorry, Zach, has been because you've shown it to me. Uh-huh. <laughs> so um, I don't have a lot of um, the, the base of reference. And that being the first kill is probably... Um, 
it probably was the most frightening to me because it was the first kill because I didn't really know what to expect in terms of how she would die or yeah. if I would see the killer or what to what extent it would be a jump scare or what have you. So um, it, it, on a second viewing, I'm sure I would my experience would probably be more similar to Mitchell's, but um, uh, d having had different experiences in terms of uh, what I can base uh, my experience with horror off of, I found the first kill to be very frightening. And that was probably the only moment in the film in which I sort of like jumped up in my chair or had a, had a oh. uh, deliberate reaction to a moment. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I will agree with you guys both that there aren't necessarily many jump moments in this. I can definitely see Claire's death being a jump moment. Um, but that's kind of an iconic moment in, in horror. Um, so I was kind of acquainted with it by the time that I eventually saw it. I do think this is filled with scenes, though, that they don't necessarily get you in the moment. But when you're walking around your house in the middle of the night or on the way to the bathroom, Ugh. like at two in the morning, mm -hmm. they come back to you and you're like, is there somebody downstairs? Like, do I hear something? <laughs> they, they like come to you in the back of your mind. Uh, the Ooh, original the tagline for this movie, when it was released <laughs> theatrically, was, if this movie doesn't make your skin crawl, it's on too tight. And uh, corny a tagline as that is, I think it's, I think it's correct. Because this movie, my skin's crawling throughout basically the entirety of it, no matter how many times I watch it. I think the standout moment is probably, it's the beginning of the climax of the film. Uh, Jess goes upstairs um, because she's been told that the killer is in the house. Uh, that's a definite skin crawl moment. Even though we know it, kind of seeing her recognize it is a definite skin crawl moment. That notorious, the kill, the calls are coming from inside the house moment. And she goes upstairs and she finds uh, Phil and uh, Barb's bodies. And then you hear Billy. Uh, he says, Agnes, don't tell him what we did. And then she turns and through the crack in the door, you just see Billy's like wide, almost mm -hmm. inhuman eyes staring out at her. And that, that shot gets me every single time. Um, and it's on my mind every single time I, like, open my door after watching this movie. I'm like, what if? Just what if I heard that voice and looked and there was an eye? It's just one of those images that sticks with you. Uh, so I do think it's it's a very, very effective horror film. Uh, it's, it's not easy to scare me with a movie. Um, I'm a huge fan of horror movies. Uh, I've seen basically all of them. I've seen a lot of terrible things. And yet this is one that, that scares me every single time. Uh, on a different note, though, there is some comedy in this film. This is a movie directed by Bob Clark, also known for directing such classics as A Christmas Story and Porky's, which is an 80s sex comedy classic, and also oh, directing wow. um, such classic films as Baby Geniuses and Super Baby's Baby Geniuses 2, which we had an English teacher back in the days of high school who liked to show the trailers for those as a joke. Um, but with that sort of comedic background in mind and the way the comedy makes its way into this movie, did you find the jokes effective? Did you find some of the moments in this movie funny, or did you just think they were distracting? I don't think that I felt like they were pressured at all. I feel like it it th I feel like it fit into the dialogue pretty easily. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that Barb joke, I think, was very warranted. Yes. And I think that was the funniest joke, because <laughs> it was a, it was a two-parter, you know? So I was like, yeah. oh, I didn't know that he was going to bring that up, and the whole station was going to laugh at him. I was like, that's... I mean, that was, like, perfectly naturally occurring. I did yeah. not feel like the comedy was forced. I didn't feel like it was intrusive. I didn't really think about it most of the time, um, unless it was obvious that a character is actually trying to tell a joke. But, I mean... I just, it didn't really, I didn't really, it was like, it wasn't plus or minus to me. It was pretty much just like a part of the, you know, characters talking. And I think that is a really good positive for the film anyway. So, mm -hmm. yeah. what do you think, Christian? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree. Um, I'm sure there were plenty of jokes in this film, but I dedicated little to no of my attention <laughs> to it because I was busy being held in suspense and yeah. scared. So that's true. Um, yeah. I guess that's probably a testament to how naturally those jokes fell. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think what what Mitchell just just addressed about the the two parter in the station and what have you that was that was at least somewhat humorous. Um, yeah. And outside of that, I'd I'd really just say I was too busy um, being frightened or held in suspense to pay much attention to the humor or even remember many other instances of humor. Yeah. Absolutely. I think a lot of the, the jokes aren't necessarily, like, this scene is a funny scene. A lot of the time there's just sort of a casual thing or a line that a character does 
that sort of lightens the mood a little bit or makes that character more likable. Uh, Barb is full of those lines. The, the one we've, mm-hmm. we've all been referring to is there's a scene where down at the police station, Officer Nash, who is sort of the butt end of a joke in a lot of the films, <laughs> asks for what the phone number is at the sorority house, and uh, she tells him that it's a, a rather dirty word, um, abbreviated <laughs> F-E, and that it's a new extension. Um, and then later in the film, when they have to reference the phone number, there's one guy in the back of the station who just starts laughing automatically. Um, and then they look at it, and they all have a good laugh at him. And I think that's probably the most the most funny thing in the movie. I think the mm-hmm. only humorous stuff that doesn't really land for me routinely is... Um, the jokes at the expense of uh, Miss Max alcoholism, where she has like bottles yeah. of bourbon and whiskey hidden all over the house. <laughs> um, I, it's, I mean, it's it's a fine gag, but it's the only one that feels sort of like this doesn't really feel like it should be in the movie. It feels like a little too over the top for the kind of movie that this is. But but overall, I think uh, Bob Clark said that when he was sort of rewriting the script, which was originally by I think A. Roy Moore. He said that he re- rewrote some of the dialogue to add kind of the astuteness and wittiness of college teens um, because he said, you know, uh, people this age aren't stupid. Uh, they're actually quite smart and they get along with their friends and they're often making j- jabs at their friends. They're, they're clever. And I think the dialogue, especially the humorous stuff, uh, really reflects that kind of cleverness and wit that they wanted to add. Uh, now, something else to talk about. This is a holiday special. We're reviewing this as a holiday special episode. So I think it's worth discussing. Uh, Kind of similar to what we did uh, last time with Die Hard, the endless debate of is Die Hard a Christmas movie. Uh, A little different, but do you think something like Black Christmas, do you think a horror film belongs in a holiday or a Christmas lineup? Does this kind of a movie work around the holidays? Or do you think this isn't the kind of thing you should necessarily be watching near to the Lord... The Lord's birth. <laughs> I think this just gives insight into Zach's thought process leading up to Halloween or Christmas <laughs> yeah. after Halloween. Every, well, I... Everything after Halloween is just post-Halloween, and then the new year is just depression leading into this spring semester, and then the summer is just like build up to Halloween again. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's Zach's entire personality. So I yeah. think, is this a Christmas movie? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's not... <laughs> I didn't learn anything, okay? I didn't even learn who Billy was, okay? I just learned how awesome a conversation could be between Billy and Barb in the beginning. All right. Because Barb, like, Barb was like, no, you. And then Bill, yeah. Billy was like, I'm going to lick that. And then Barb was like, I'm going to lick that. And it's like, oh, damn. That was crazy. Yeah. Anyway, um, that was actually funny. I forgot to mention that. That oh, yeah. was actually funny. I started to laugh a little bit, and then he was like, I'm going to kill you. I was like, oh, no, this is yeah. supposed to be serious. Whoops, I messed up. Um, but anyway... Um, I don't think, I mean, it really depends on your mood. Like I said, I mean, I'm pretty, that's what I'm implying. I feel like whatever your mood is, if you, if you're watching horror movies and you don't, you know, if you don't care about Christmas enough to watch 15 Christmas movies that are happy, like I do every year, because that's what Christmas is supposed to be, Zach. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't really make a difference. I think, I think Christmas is just like another, you know, little aesthetic, um, that I think it works pretty well. I, especially with, like I said, like the caroling was like the biggest instance of yeah. it. Um, and just the decorations and stuff. But I don't think Christmas was really forced that hard. I feel like Christmas was more present in Die Hard than it was in this. Um, yeah. to be honest, but I think, you know, just, just the mood and like, you know, them being on winter break in the sorority house and everything. I think that just, it's another part of the setting. I don't think it was like integral to, you know, I don't think you need to be like in the Christmas mood or anything to like, you know, get fully indulged. So, mm-hmm. Alrighty. What do you think, Christian? Yeah, I mostly agree with what Mitchell said, and I, I want to give you a bit of a defense, Zach, okay. because I know that despite your rough exterior, you've you've got a you've got a heart that grows three sizes come Christmas <laughs> under that. And to to the to our viewers that can't see, um, Zach's room is adorned with some Christmas lights and what have you. So yes. d- despite what, what what he might tell you otherwise, he is he is on occasion a jolly fellow. Mm-hmm. So. There, had to be said. Also, thank you for asking this question because I now feel valid for asking something similar when we were talking about Die Hard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, in, in terms of this being a Christmas film, I mean, sure, why not? I, I don't think that, um, I don't feel qualified to say that Die Hard is more of a Christmas film than this is. Um, and uh, I, I think the setting, like Mitchell said, is pretty well incorporated and um, 
it was really, uh, I think, most important because you have that initial scene where everyone at the party is around the phone and it's really chilling to everyone. Mm -hmm. And then because of the holidays, um, they're all they all leave. And that sort of creates um, the 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 opening for the killer to to, uh, pick people off and um, for there to be confusion in the house in general. So Mm -hmm. um, to that extent, it was effective. And um, yeah, Mitchell's right, though. Christmas should be happy. (laughs) uh, i i would never i would never watch this um on my own accord around christmas because it doesn't make me happy (laughs) that's fair and that's the that's probably like the the uh the most zoomer thing i could say and uh, a summation of my uh critical shortcomings but all that being said i think this is like i said i think it's a great film and it's set during christmas so if it's your jam yeah watch it during christmas why not yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I think something to, to to acknowledge is that regardless of somebody's beliefs, whether they're Christian or not, uh, if they're going to celebrate Christmas, a lot of the time it's because they want it to be, you know, a happy, festive time to gather with family. Uh, but but something I think to think back to is sort of the history of, of Christmas and historical Christmas traditions, uh, in which Christmas was not only a time for, for joy and festivity, but also a time for kind of, uh, for scares and sort of recognizing maybe the darker side of winter. Uh, there's a reason the song, uh, The Most Wonderful Time of the Year, has the line and scary ghost stories of Christmases long, long ago in it. Uh, because it used to be a tradition to sit around and tell ghost stories on Christmas Eve and see how, how badly we can scare each other. Um, and sort of reflect kind of the, the coldness and the darkness outside in spite of sort of the warmth of gathering with family and, friend, family and friends. Uh, and so, you know, if if you're the type of person who wants to uh, maybe replicate or reflect that sort of old tradition. I think this is a good way to do that. Um, you know, I'm 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 with friends and with my family, and we want to watch something kind of kind of creepy around the around the fire with the Christmas tree, all the glow, all on the couch, uh, to you know draw ourselves closer in this Christmas season. We want to we want to spook each other out, and I think that that Black Christmas will definitely do that. I think it'll it'll spook you out, so you're even more eager to put on a Christmas vacation or Elf, or something like that right afterward, and laugh together after you've been scared together. Uh, so if, if you're the type of person who likes horror, you need something for the Christmas holidays, and I think this is a, a great choice. Much better than, like, Silent Night, Deadly Night, or something like that. Don't, don't go with that. Go with Black Christmas. Um, mm. Yeah, that's, that's everything that I've got noted down. Uh, any final thoughts from you guys about the film before we move on to Christian's legacy segment? <laughs> <laughs> um do i have final thoughts um i i will be very forward with you zach for for most of this film i was thinking you know i bet this is going to be another three out of five where i have to admit that it doesn't suck but i also have to say that i didn't like it and um but but as i was getting closer to the end i was like oh my gosh is this a is this a 4.5 wow is this like in the in the in the general real estate of potentially being a five if it didn't have plot holes, I was really really getting there. Mm-hmm. I was really getting there, Zach, and um, I, I was impressed, thoroughly impressed. So I don't want my uh, my plot hole thing to uh, to sully the uh, other positive things that I think this film accomplishes because uh, it accomplishes them quite well. Um, and uh, in, in terms of it being a Christmas movie or whatever, I think we've addressed that well. Um, I would just say very solid four out of five. If you uh, forced me to choose whether it was closer to a 3.5 or a 4.5, I'd say it's closer to a 4.5. I was thoroughly impressed. And uh, I hope this is the first of many in a series of better than three out of fives. And uh, yeah, I I look forward to discussing whether um, our last film is also a Christmas movie or not. (laughs) It's going to be a running thing, yeah. (laughs) Yes, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> I I did I really like this and you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the bomb on Zach so he doesn't understand and even Christian doesn't understand that this reminded me a oh. lot about Silent Hill and I'm not gonna go along describing Silent Hill. Um, yeah. mm. but essentially when you're playing the original Silent Hill games and even the newer ones you're basically the, the first of all the settings are already very disturbing mm-hmm. but there's always there it's one of the first horror games that was able to to take 
take advantage of the atmosphere and the organic and just raw existence of everything being frightening because a lot of new horror movies feel like they have to twist and turn everything that's normal or make things that are normal appear abnormal and just kind of work with that, you know, as if it's that, you know, simplistic of a binary. But I feel like I feel like this film, like I'll think about one scene um, when the officer, uh, the lieutenant goes in and like, you know, goes to the piano and then the camera moves ever so slightly as he goes over to the piano and checks out the uh, the microphone stand yeah. um, on the piano. And then the guy comes in and is like, oh, the, they're on the phone again or whatever. And then he leaves. Mm -hmm. That whole scene was probably like 25 to 30 seconds. Right. Yeah. And it could have been like five or six seconds and it probably would have been in a modern movie. Yeah. So I just feel like just little things like that, it feels like you're there, it feels really organic. And Silent Hill is very similar in that not only do they have like a fixed camera, but like most of the game, you're just walking around and you only see a little bit in front of you because of the light on your on your chest, right? So I just thought about it like there's almost no music. In fact, there is no music throughout most of the game. Mm -hmm. And you're just walking around the entire time and all you're doing is just taking in the atmosphere and just listening for things happening. And essentially, that is most of this film. You're just, you're going, you're walking around trying to figure out what's going on. Sometimes you're even in the perspective of the killer himself. And just all of that is just so original. And I think it, you know, really shows like what you can act, what little, what, what a lot you can do with what little you have. Um, mm. So I, I give this a definite four out of five. And I feel like it's definitely necessary, especially if you're a slasher fan. I feel like this is definitely yeah. like one of the best, you know, slasher movies ever made. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of slashers, to be honest, especially yeah. newer ones. But, yeah, four out of five, definitely. There's very little, really, that you have to – there's very re little you have to, like, critique and just nothing really sticks out to me that's, like, super annoying or anything. So, yeah. definite, you know, must watch for somebody who's a Satanist like Zach, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer, I am not actually a Satanist. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, if, if, I, I guess if you enjoy this film, maybe check out the Silent Hill games. I cannot speak to that myself, as I am not a video game man. Uh, joining the ranks of I am not a music man as things I am also not. Um, a communist. Yeah, I, I would say my rewatch of this film is just a testament to the fact that rewatch movies that you might not have gotten necessarily the first time around. Yeah. I've watched this film a couple of different times, and I enjoyed it the most this past time. So, you know, maybe maybe there's some movies out there that you enjoy but didn't enjoy that much. Give them a rewatch. You, you might get a lot more out of them. Uh, because I am a grown man who loves horror movies, and this is a movie that after I watched it, I legitimately checked my closet and under my bed for Home Invaders. And that's the <laughs> sign of an effective horror film if ever I saw one. So check it out, four out of five. We, we all seem to enjoy it quite a bit. Uh, and with that, I guess I'll hand it over to Christian for the rundown. Hey, I think I hear a phone ringing in the distance. We better uh, get this off quickly. All right. Okay, um, sixty <laughs> seconds. Um, uh, a list of a list of terms uh, from this film that we've just discussed, and uh, Mitchell and I will inundate Zach with um, peculiarities, and he'll have to respond with a. Uh, quantitative value are you ready to start us off mitchell i'm ready <laughs> oh god okay three two one off we go follow shots four out of five the mormon tabernacle choir three out of five shaky cam that i've seen before somewhere four out of five plastic bags as a choking hazard three out of five i'm going to kill you four out of five hooks Three out of five. Christmas being the only aesthetic still in style. Three out of five. Pulling a Han Solo before Han Solo. T two out of five. <laughs> Sororities. <laughs> Three out of five. No one bothering to search the house. Three out of five. Mouth breathing with a stuffy nose. Four out of five. Cussing Santa. Four out of five. Prank calls. Four out of five. Really good cat impersonation. Three out of five. Public servants with attitudes that really suck. Three out of five. Abandoning dreams of being a concert pianist. Three out of five. B for booze. Three out of five. Remembering to lock those doors and windows. Four out of five. Walking out the front door. Four out of five. One second, children caroling. Three out of five. Ding! Okay. <laughs> we got it off. Oh, okay. man. Whew. All righty. Thanks for putting up with that again, Zach. Only had yes. one. We had one we didn't do. Oh, wow. All right. Well, that will go in the end of next season's rundown we got to figure out how we're going to do that but it'll show up again <laughs> eventually 
Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that is the end of our discussion on Black Christmas, but with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mitchell to give us a bit of a sneak peek on what we're going to be talking about in our next holiday special. We're going to be talking about Star Trek The Next Generation <laughs> and Patrick Stewart and and A Christmas Carol. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which are all the same thing. <laughs> they're all part of the same thing. They're, they're all the same, okay? Yes, A Christmas Carol featuring Patrick Stewart, I, I think 1999. Yes, yeah. that one. Um, Alrighty. It is my favorite Christmas Carol one, and uh, I guess Zach doesn't like it as much because he sucks, but Christian <laughs> might like it. Um, so hopefully we have some dissenting opinions so we can argue about something for once. Yes. <laughs> this is I, I expected that this would be another Mitchell and I go back-to-back against Christian episode, but it didn't work <laughs> out rather miraculously. So maybe, hey. maybe you guys will be going back-to-back against me for Patrick Quite Stewart's yes. Christmas Carol next time. I look forward to it. <laughs> uh, so if you'd like to see a two-on-one brawl uh, regarding A Christmas Carol, <laughs> check out the next holiday special for Cookie Pocket and Attempt at a Podcast. Uh, until then, adios. Merry Christmas!